listening to the Read Aloud Revival podcast. This is the podcast that inspires you to build your family culture around books. You know, Shakespeare has so much to tell us in the modern world. There, there's so many great moral values. There's so many... Um, uh, ways of, uh, the basic philosophy is a kindly, humane um, uh, way of looking at life. If you are brand new to the podcast, welcome. This is the Read Aloud Revival, and this is where we talk about the books that we're reading with our kids, motivating ourselves to read more to our kids. And we've had some great guests, Andrew Pudua from the Institute for Excellence in Writing, Adam Andrews from the Center for Lit, Jim Weiss from Great Hall Productions, Tish Oxenrider from um, The Art of Simple. So if you head to readaloudrevival.com, you can get access to all of the podcasts. They're all free. They're all there. And I hope they're all motivating to you. That's readaloudrevival.com. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Audible. Audible is the place to get your audiobooks for those times when you want to read aloud, but you just can't get to it, or maybe for long car rides or while you're tackling that laundry pile. If you head to audibletrial.com slash read aloud, you can get a free audiobook just for trying Audible. And there's a 30-day trial there. It's a really awesome service. I think you'll like it. So head to audibletrial.com slash read aloud. I'm pretty sure that I always say, this is the best podcast yet. (laughs) So you're probably not going to believe me anymore. (laughs) But this is an amazing podcast. I got to talk to Ken Ludwig, who is the author of How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. An amazing book, and it was an amazing conversation. And I'm so excited about it. I'm trying not to leap out of my chair because I just hung up the phone with him. And it's just great. In fact, I recorded this about a week before I'm going to air it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to wait as long as I said I would. (laughs) I'm so excited to share it with you. So stick around. This is going to be an awesome hour. Ken is the author of one of my favorite books, How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare. We are loving this book at our house, and I'm always raving about it on my blog. Ken is also an internationally acclaimed playwright whose work has been performed in more than 30 countries in over 20 languages. He has had six shows on Broadway and six in London's West End. His plays have been commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Bristol Old Vic, and his first play on Broadway, Lend Me a Tenor, won three Tony Awards and was nominated for nine. He's also won two Olivier Awards, which is England's highest theater honor. And his other best-known Broadway and West End shows include Crazy for You, Moon Over Buffalo, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Three Musketeers, Treasure Island, and several others. He has degrees from Harvard, where he studied music with Leonard Bernstein, Haverford College, and Cambridge University. How to Teach Your Children Shakespeare is a book that describes the methods Ken used while teaching his own children how to understand and love the works of the bard, beginning with memorization of short, specific passages from Shakespeare's plays. It's easier and more enjoyable than you think, probably. I I knew I had something of an affinity for Shakespeare myself from when I was introduced to Hamlet in high school, but using Ken's book with my kids has just absolutely lit me on fire. The book leads you and your kids on an adventure through plays like A Midsummer Night's Dream, Twelfth Night, Macbeth, and Romeo and Juliet. You don't need to know any Shakespeare to get going. It's pretty foolproof, which is why I love it so much. Ken makes Shakespeare very accessible, and the book offers parents step-by-step methods for giving their kids and probably themselves a lifetime's worth of appreciation for Shakespeare's never-ending art and wisdom. He tells you what to do, 
what it means, and how to explain it to your kids. So I'll have a link in the show notes so that you can find a copy for yourself. It's well worth getting your hands on. And just this month, July of 2014, the book is being released in paperback. So there's never been a better time to get it. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him to the show. So hello, Ken. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, can we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family? Sure. Uh, I um, uh, I am a full-time playwright. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been married for many years, and I have two kids, uh, two great kids, I might add, um, uh, one in high school and one in college. And um, the book really describes sort of the journey I took with each of the kids individually, because they're four years apart, in, in trying to teach them uh, all, all about Shakespeare, my my sort of greatest passion. Yeah, so when you first introduced your kids to Shakespeare, did you know how you were going to do it? Did you did you sort of feel like you were fumbling around, see what worked, or did you go in with a plan? I did not go in with a plan at first. Uh, that is, it, took, it, it wasn't long till I figured the plan out. Uh, what, what happened was my daughter came home from first grade uh, and one day and 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 proudly spoke a line of Shakespeare. She said, guess what, Dad or Daddy? Uh, I know a bank where the wild time blows, which is a, a line from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, I was blown away, I, I, and I asked her how she learned it, and she said, well, in school, our teacher is teaching us a couple lines of Shakespeare, and it turns out their teacher uh, is this, was this wonderful, she still teaches at the same school, a wonderful English woman who herself loved Shakespeare and thought the kids could learn a couple of lines, and and I thought, gee, what a great idea. Uh, um, I've loved Shakespeare all my life, it really has been my sort of private passion, and it had not occurred to me to start teaching the kids Shakespeare as early as that, but a sort of light bulb went off in my head, and I thought, oh, what fun, what fun. So we tried it, and I started, um, uh, sort of took the next Saturday and carved an hour out of the day and and sat down with my daughter and, and, and started talking about Shakespeare. And as we talked about it, and I tried to describe A Midsummer Night's Dream a little bit, which the teacher had started to tell them about. It It really is the best book, I think, to start, or the, the best, excuse me, of the plays to start with with your kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, I, w- I started quoting from it, and her eyes lit up, and she really loved hearing the beauty of the language. It was just such an innate thing. Yeah. You know, six-year-olds love nursery rhymes the same way. They love that you know, beautiful rhythm uh, of the poetry. And so that that's when it occurred to me that maybe the key to getting her involved was having her memorize short passages of Shakespeare. Mm, okay. And that's, and, and, and that's what we did. Now, what about your relationship with Shakespeare's work? Have you always, you know, when did you first fall in love with, with Shakespeare, I guess? I fell in love with it when I was was in, I think, high school, sort of junior high school. My parents, very kindly, for one of my birthdays, they had seen on Broadway years before this this moment in time Richard Burton's Hamlet. There was a famous uh, uh, production of Hamlet on Broadway with the actor Richard Burton, who a lot of kids may not know now, and some parents may not know, but he was in his time one of the great heartthrobs in the in the uh, on stage in the movies. He was married to Elizabeth Taylor. He was also a very very great Shakespearean actor. He's Welsh, uh, and um, uh, he did a Hamlet on Broadway that was directed by John Gilgood, and it was it was the longest running Hamlet uh, on in Broadway history. <laughs> and they made there was a recording of it. Uh, on LPs, and my parents bought me that as a present, and I started to listen to it when I was in high school, and I just loved it. I just, for whatever s- strange reason, I just loved it, and my my love of interest, uh, my, my my love of Shakespeare, really took off from there. Wow. Okay, that's very inspiring. Well, it's inspiring to hear that it's something that was introduced to you in youth, and um, it's kind of that. 
don't know, that innate love for the beautiful and the true and good things. I think that that's really encouraging. So what surprised you the most about the way your daughter reacted to Shakespeare when you first introduced her? Was it the lang- the beauty of the language resonating with her or, I mean, was it harder to, to do or was it, did it come more easily to her than you expected it to? It, it came, that was a great, very astute. That's exactly right. It came more easily than I expected. If you had asked me, gee, could I teach a, a six-year-old some passages from Shakespeare? I'd have thought, gee, that's, Probably not, but this <laughs> teacher had inspired us that way, and it, it, it became clear to me early on that, of course, the ones that she was able to pick up, really, it wasn't a question of their having easier words, because kids often learn nursery rhymes. They don't always necessarily know the words at first till you explain it to them, but it was the beauty of the sound of the passages, that very first passage, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. It's a very beautiful, reassuring passage that children really relate to. It describes flowers. It's gentle mm-hmm. uh, and non-threatening, and she just took to it. Yeah, it just kind of rolls off your tongue. My eight-year-old son, so I have three bigger kids. They're 12, 10, and 8, and then three babies and toddlers, but they're not memorizing Shakespeare, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so my eight-year-old son is the one that kind of floored me because I didn't expect him to take to Shakespeare so much, but he was the one that memorized it the quickest and that Aww. was really just caught up in the beauty of the language. And yeah, that's really that's great. That's pretty great powerful. To hear. Yeah, very sweet. So what was your greatest challenge in teaching Shakespeare to your kids? Well, at first, it it was more of a joy than a challenge because, I mean, it did take me some work to figure out, try try to think, now let's see, uh, what passage should we try next? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I know my Shakespeare pretty well, uh, (laughs) but I I wanted to put them in a real sequential order where again and again it was something that she was ready for. So when she turned, by the time she finished age six, she'd learned maybe, because I think I started late in her sixth year, um, uh, maybe four passages. And then, uh, you know, in the book there are 25 passages, but those pretty much uh, uh, represent uh, from being a youngster to maybe being in your early to mid teens teens, because that they really, uh, I, I do an overview in the book of, of passages from easy to more difficult. Mm-hmm. In between the passages you see in the book, there may have been three or four other passages that, again, were nice. The first 10 or 15 were all Midsummer Night's Dream, because it's so accessible, yep. it has such a sweet story. Um, uh, it's a fun story because of the magic. Yes. So I, I, I think for her, from from the time she was six, we may have spent two full years on Midsummer Night's Dream passages. Oh wow! Maybe okay. Okay. It, maybe a little less because there were so many. I have about four or five in the book, but I pro- she probably learned fifteen or twenty passages, and they got more and more complex too, because when you get into Oberon and Titania, they they become. Uh, a, a little more compl- uh, complica- complicated in a, in a wonderful way, in a magical, r- romantic, almost mystical way. And, and it's, it was just shockingly great how much, again, memor- kids love to memorize. It's a natural thing to them. It is, yeah. Yeah, it sh- always shocks me at how much quicker they can memorize something than I can. <laughs> I have <laughs> to work too. so much harder at it. <laughs> me too. Well, that's something I really appreciate about your book, actually. It's not, you don't just say, um, you know, this is a great way to memorize Shakespeare. First you do this, and then you do this, and techniques. But you tell us, first memorize this passage, and then you go a step further and say, this is what's happening. Because I think 
for a lot of parents, you know, for a lot of us, we never have been exposed to Shakespeare in a way that we feel like we understand it. And so we're really kind of intimidated to start. And so probably what I appreciate best about your book is the way you hold our hand all the way through. You know, this is what's happening in the play. And this is how you should memorize this particular passage. Okay, you got that? Now let's move on to the next piece. And it's just, it, it is a very accessible way for the rest of us to understand what's going on. And it's made it less intimidating for me to jump into Shakespeare with my kids. So I love well, that. Know, I think Shakespeare is, is it is intimidating to all of us at first. I and mean, the more more I got into this, I've been thinking a lot about it because I'm going to be delivering some uh, speeches up at the Stratford Festival in Ontario in about two weeks. They asked me to come up and talk about the book. Oh, okay. And the thing about Shakespeare is that it's almost like a foreign language. That's how I like to talk about it, and I'll be talking to everybody up there about it, is that you know, we, 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 we all feel intimidated when we first hear it, just the way we would all feel intimidated if suddenly we were, we were plopped down in Italy and we heard people speaking Italian and we were told, gee, we should understand this. Well, we can understand it. We can understand a few words. We get the gist when people talk to us. But it's when we learn what some of those words really mean that we can really relate to it. And, it, and, and that demystifies it. Suddenly, it yeah. becomes less intimidating when we you can't you can't listen to the to be or not to be speech without knowing what the word bodkin means. Bodkin means a dagger; it's a sword. And he says to be or not to be, and the word comes up in the first say eight lines. Mm-hmm. There mm-hmm. are words that we just don't understand unless we have have definitions of them. Yeah, and I think even in that very first passage that you have us memorize, I know a bank where the wild time blows. I think I'm looking for it here. I don't see where, but I think you may have even explained that um, blows yeah, have been I understood so as growing. Yeah. So it, it, that's, it is like a whole different language. I think that's a big piece of why it's confusing. And then I, or you know, why it's intimidating, I should say. And then, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So until if, you you learn it, and and then if you te- one of the things when I speak about the book, uh, I take people through one of the passages. I often with adults will use. Uh, um, if there's kids in the audience, I'll use I know a bank or 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 uh, uh, what is love not hereafter. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but but if when I'm with adults, I often use uh, the, the passage from um, Twelfth Night. Make me a willow cabin at your gate, and mm-hmm. call upon my soul within the house. And, and, and by taking it sort of we're almost word by word, and making sure that we understand what the character is saying, you know, uh, it's a young woman who's expressing how she would really declare her love to someone. And she says, "Make me a willow cabin at your gate." She mm-hmm. literally means to construct a little house made of willow. Leaves <laughs> and call upon my soul within the house. Well, does she mean her own soul, or does she mean the person she's talking to? Because that person, she's so in love with that person, is that become like her own soul? And <laughs> kids get this; they understand it once you explain it very, you know, simply and carefully. They get it. Yeah, and then once we've done that a few times, what I've noticed is that my kids are not intimidated by Shakespeare at all the way that I am. And I think because they have all these experiences of meeting him in very accessible terms that it's, Mm -hmm. that it's not so intimidating to start. So um, that kind of leads me into another question I wanted to ask you, which is what do you think of reading Shakespearean retellings to our kids? I've, I've heard people say that reading retellings doesn't really count as encountering Shakespeare, you know. So I wonder if you can speak to that a bit, you know, a little bit. I, I can. I can, absolutely. And I think it's great. Okay. I think it's absolutely great. I think any way at all that the kids get uh, introduced to Shakespeare, learn the stories, learn the names of the characters, is it, good. It doesn't mean that we're not encountering Shakespeare. And Shakespeare is great not only for his language and his words, he's great for the stories he made up. Um, many of them were adapted from other works of literature you know, prior, to, prior to his lifetime. Um, some were original. It, it, the stories are great. The characters are great. I think, uh, gee, I, I would use books with sort of, there are some sort of almost cartoon-like uh, retellings of the stories. Yeah. Some were just with pretty illustrations. I, I use those for the kids all the time. 
Okay, that's great to hear. Yeah, when we when we started working through your book, um, we got the Young Readers Shakespeare version um, of A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'll link to that in the show notes because we actually we have tried to get our hands on pretty much every um, every one in that series because they're really well done. They have really beautiful illustrations, but they are great. Yeah, yeah and it great. really helps you understand what's going on in the story. So then, when we would get to the next passage that you'd have us memorize, we we totally understand what was happening and already have kind of a relationship with the character that was saying it. So it's kind of fun. That's great. That's a great idea. Yeah. And the book, that's really good. Yep. I did the same with my kids. So did you have a timeline in mind for how long it would take a parent and child to work through the book? Is it something that you think, you know, we work through from beginning to end over a childhood or something we um, use as a jumping off point or... Well, no, no. Uh, it's a jumping off point, I think. Because, as I said, the book, the passages in the book do span what I taught the kids from maybe age six, because when my son then came along, I started with him at the same age, and 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 right almost till my daughter Olivia went off to college, simply because we liked doing it so much. And I'm glad to say that, I, in all truth, they just looked forward to that time on the weekend. We'd always do it on the weekends. Okay. As school got busier and busier, of course, by the time Olivia was about 16, it started to fade away because, you know, there were so many school obligations. Mm -hmm. But uh, 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 up until that, and and boy, she put uh, way over a thousand lines under her belt that she can now, it's really gratifying. We were with friends the other night. And they just started bantering off lines to each other because they just like (laughs) to do it. Yeah. They just like it. And and so we sat and we, we did it every single weekend religiously because we loved it every Saturday and every Sunday. So it was two hours each for each kid each weekend. I never did combine them together because it was a spe- you know it was a really kind of a special time with each one. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, I think that I do combine mine. It's more of a necessity, I think, just to be able to get to make it a priority. But I think I right, right. definitely see how my kids would love to do that is a special time with mom or dad. And either one works. And the times we did combine, which we did you know, se- several times, that then they would have have the fun of, in a way, competing with each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who can remember yeah. more? <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, what, well, you've kind of answered this, actually. I'll skip that one. That was what ages. Uh what would you say, what's the first thing you would say to a parent who says to you, I am so intimidated by Shakespeare, I just don't know where to start? What would you say to them besides get my book? Because that's what I tell everybody. You just get this book, <laughs> then you'll oh, know where thanks. to start. But do you have like a, anything you like to say in particular? Yeah, I, I do. A couple things. One is, in addition to the book itself, Random House has done a terrific job in creating a, a website for the book, which is it is how to teach your children Shakespeare dot com. Right. So, mm-hmm. The title of the book is dot com, and, and and it's very, it, it ha- you you can print all the passages in that nice big type that I mentioned that makes it more accessible. But even better than that is uh, I convinced uh, uh, some actor friends of mine uh, I'll mention in a second to record all the passages in the book. And 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 you don't have to buy the book to have done it. There's no password. You can just go to that any any old time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and they are spoken so beautifully and so simply and with so much integrity and beauty that um, uh, uh, that's one of the ways. that I think so, a parent who might say, "Gee, I, I've never encountered Shakespeare in a way that I was comfortable." Go just turn those on and listen to those passages, and I think you'll be reassured that it's not intimidating, or, or I guess intimidating is, is how it strikes you personally, but it, it's not difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. You simply have to go slowly at first and learn every word of every passage so you know that what it, learn what each word means, and then just repeat them aloud. And, and listening to the passages, I think, is a big help on the website. Yeah, one one thing that we really appreciate about those audio clips you have on your website is that if I don't know how to pronounce a name, it's really great because I realized I read, um, I was saying 
now I'm going to say it the wrong way, Hippolyta instead of saying Hippolyta, or am I getting that mixed mm-hmm. up now? Yeah. So um, that kind of thing is really helpful to go and, yeah. or if I'm just kind of struggling with the cadence, although you break that down really well in your book too, but it is nice to have those um, audio clips to listen to. Hearing it aloud really is helpful, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Very helpful. And then the quotation sheets or the passages um, that you have there to print out are great too. Those are Make it, oh, yeah, they make it very easy to see, to memorize when you see it broken down the way you've done that. So that's really helpful. Um, so some families I know seem to shrink away from Shakespeare because they're a bit apprehensive about any impropriety in his work. So can you speak to that a bit and how you have handled those kind of issues um, with your own kids or in the methods that you outline in your book? Sure. A- absolutely. Um, the The... First of all, I, I don't think any of the passages that I use in the book have any improprieties. I think it is important. Look, she, you know, at six years old and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve, uh, I, I didn't want to use anything that would be, uh, you know, really inappropriate for that age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I feel exactly the same way. I'm a parent, and I, I don't want it. Uh, I don't want the kids dwelling on those things. So I. I didn't use Titus Andronicus. Boy, talk about a terribly violent play. It was, in a sense, an early play of Shakespeare's. It's almost like a modern horror movie. It oh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. Tremendously disturbing. I, 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 don't, I don't like it. Uh, and it's not a very good play. It's a very early play. But, uh, and, and I, I, you know, um, Macbeth is, has, you know, it's a, that's about a murder, but it's really about someone who is so struck uh, by the horror of his own deed, that his conscience mm-hmm. yeah. he struggles with his own conscience about the, the 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 deed he's committed. Now that's a play that I don't didn't introduce to my kids until they were maybe twelve or thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I, I I but but when they were old enough to discuss issues like that, what a great time to discuss those issues. Exactly. Because yeah, and a great what way, a good way a great, to do it. Yeah, it's a great channel right into that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Same with Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you're you, gee, when you're young, you can be impulsive, and 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 and, and if there's any great example of, of, of look, look what being impulsive led to. Right. Uh, in, in, the, in the wrong way. It's Romeo and Juliet. Yes. <laughs> yep. Well, I have some um, some questions from readers. I don't know if you're up to tackling a few of those. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, Sherry wants to know, she recently purchased the book, and she wants to know if she should read through it first and then teach it, or if she can just kind of launch into it right with her kids. I have an opinion on that, too, but I'll let you say what you thought. I think. <laughs> I think launch right into it. Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say, too. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's a little intimidating even for a parent to try to get the whole thing under their belt. Maybe stay a chapter ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Re- read the chapter ahead, but just go ahead and launch into it and have, have fun with it. Yeah, I haven't even been a whole chapter ahead. I think I've been, you know, a few pages ahead of where we've been so far. And great. it's worked great. That's been no problem. Good. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so is the, are there... Um, adaptations or retellings that you in particular um, recommend, like the Charles and Mary Lamb or the Nesbitt? Um, you know what I'm talking about? I can't remember. I do, absolutely. Okay. I, I mentioned them in the bibliography, and, and you've really hit on two of the ones that I like best. Okay. Charles and Mary Lamb uh, is uh, from Victorian times, so it's a little it's a little old fashioned, but they were done with such care and such beauty, and and they were also very careful to to um, they didn't address the subplots or anything that would be disturbing to children. It was really meant to be a retelling for children. Okay, it's called Tales from Shakespeare. So it, it and it's beautifully written. It's it's a work of art in itself, and it's very accessible. So Charles and Mary Lamb, absolutely been in print for all, all you know for the past 150 years yeah i think there's even fr- um on books should be free.com i'll look and i'll put a link in the show notes but i think there are some audio versions that are free that you can listen to and stream yeah them. i'm sure absolutely yeah. and that's really great and telling the story overall are very nice actually i'm very near my as we're talking here i'm very near a shelf i have of uh of uh of shakespeare for kids and retellings and um um 
Oh yes, this, uh, the bibliography contains a whole section on 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 uh, retellings. There's one called the Young Person's Guide to Shakespeare, and it's written by someone named Anita Ganeri, G A N E R I, and it has a CD with it. Okay. Has very beautiful uh, photographs and illustrations. Uh, it's a nice sort of big picture picture book. Most okay. of them are photographs. Very intelligent. It's about Shakespeare overall, who were the leading actors and actors and actresses and, and what the Globe Theater looked like. And, and it's great to give the kids an overview. I'll never forget telling my son um, this. I, I recount the story in the book is uh, um, how, and, and there is a whole book about this incident when. Um, uh, Shakespeare was a member of this company called the Lord Chamberlain's Men, who was an actor and, and was a shareholder in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, they lost their lease on the the theater that they played in, which was one of the very, very first theaters ever built in London. And, wow. and that theater was called, to make things a little confusing, The Theater. That was its title. <laughs> the way we'd say The Globe or The Rose. Or yeah, the, yeah. It was The Theater with a capital T. And when the theater, they lost their lease on it, but they lost their lease on the ground. On the ground, it was built on. They there was a different way of looking at property in those days. They didn't lose their lease on the timber. And that that is, they because they had built it, they owned the timber. Okay. So one, and they knew the 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 person who who thought he owned all of it would be away. And one night. In, it was uh, in the winter time. It was around Christmas. Mm-hmm. They the, all the company got together. They disassembled the theater, and they put it on boats. They crossed the Thames and they built the Globe Theater out of the same timbers and the, and the same sort of design. Oh wow! And it's a great story because it's a, it's like it's like a, a kind of a thriller. It's a it's a fun story, and there there is a book about that and those sorts of things. Kids just love. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to get so that one's that one's not in Anita Ganeri's book, is it? Uh, that that story may well be in there. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and look, as I'm sitting here, there's one called. Wait, here's a book called. I bet the story's in here. Uh, there's another book called Shakespeare's Theater by Andrew Langley, L A N G L E Y. Okay. Some of these could be out of print, but that mm-hmm. you know they'll be easily you can easily get them on you know ABE books. Or, yeah, or I'll find them like online that. and try and make it easy for people to find them. Yeah, that's a nice one. And then there's a, a, a very nice series that I always loved with the kids called the Shakespeare Library, put out by Heinemann. I think it's an English publication. These are nice big paperbacks. They're thin. And there's one called Shakespeare Plays, one on Twelfth Night, one called Shakespeare's Theater, one on Macbeth, one on Shakespeare Life. I'm just looking at there's a pile of them. And they're all by um, Wendy Greenhill. Okay. Spelled just the way it sounds. Okay. Who's head of education at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And Paul Wignall, W-I-G-N-A-L-L. And they're produced by Heinemann. Okay. H e i n e m a n n. That's the publisher, and they're they're a wonderful series. For okay, kids. okay, good. I'll look those up. Very good. So, if a um, if somebody wants to explore a play that's not included in the book, what do you think are the most important parts? Of, well, I think you kind of explain this in your book. You know how to memorize. You explain how to memorize, so that would be pretty easy to figure out from your instructions in the book. But what other parts of the process of enjoying Shakespeare would we not want to leave out? Um, or maybe a better way to ask that is, um, should we just focus on the plot and the characters um, without too much analysis, you know, for the younger kids and just help them enjoy the language? Or what pieces do you think we should focus on? Well, again, I think the best way to, to introduce them to each of the plays is by choosing passages uh, in the plays, and, and and the way, I don't have the book to hand right now, but I know that in the back of the book, I, I list 155, uh, or is it 55? No, I think it's 155. 55, I have it right here. Yes, it's appendix 50, uh, 3. 55 mm-hmm. yeah. Additional passages that I use with the kids. So, for example, because of the length of the book, I didn't get to talk about all my favorite plays. Much Ado About Nothing. I didn't want to do all the comedies I 
I write tend to write comedies as a playwright, so I tend to love the comedies the yeah. best. One of my very, very favorites, and it's such a great play, and it's on right now in New York at the Public Theater. Oh, outdoor, cool. Delacourt. is Much Ado About Nothing. Very accessible for young people because it, it's such a fun story. Uh, the characters, Beatrice and Benedict, are so lively, and they were the first you know, loving couple to really, that their arguments... Uh, on stage were the stuff of the comedy and the and, and the way we knew that how much they loved each other, just the way, you know, I love Lucy or, you know, yeah, yeah. That, the great <laughs> tradition of, you know, sort of the warring couple. And, and, and then you say, well, how do I approach Much Ado About Nothing? Well, the way to approach it would be, for example, to get one of the books for young people about it, re- read a synopsis of it, and then go right to the back of the book and pick those passages that I mentioned. Yeah, you've got a lot of great ones here. This is enough to, I I don't think I would feel like I needed to pick a passage myself ever. You've got great, a great treasure trove here. Yeah, I took a lot of time with those to to come up with them so that that parents would feel, gee, because if if you're a parent and you, you don't know the play yourself very well, where would you start looking for passages? Right. <laughs> Hard to figure out. So that's yeah. what I tried to provide. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and that's in Appendix 3 for all of you listeners out there when you get your hands on the book. Um, it, they're right in the back, and that's uh, Yeah, it's right really in the helpful. back, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you recommend seeing a performance or watching a movie before reading a play or the other way around, or does it matter? I'd say before if you can do it. Okay. Uh, uh, you don't want to be in, tim- you know, if it's an adult version of the play, it may say, get wearisome. Or, uh, the, the Globe Theater in, in London has put out a lot of their productions now, and I think they're great and they're wonderful, but, you know, they're full length, they're full text, and, you know, a kid's eyes might cross by an hour, two and a half. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, we, and that's what we don't want. We want them to feel, oh, wow, this is fun and accessible. So maybe do it, the, maybe put it on if you, can, if you have access to, it, to a, a nice video and just look at the first scene together. Yeah, okay. To get things started. Or even, and maybe even finding the scenes that are the passages you're memorizing from. Yeah, even okay. better. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, very good. Is there anything else you think we should know? A couple things that crossed my mind as we were talking I didn't get to say. One is that in discussing accessible scenes or scenes to start with with kids, and I didn't get to say this in the book, is often the opening passage of a, of a play, not always, but often that'll be helpful. It's it's very nice. Like in A Midsummer Night's Dream, I think I get to it in the book. I don't remember. But now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on a pace, mm-hmm. is a, is a wonderful passage. Mm-hmm. And the the opening uh, lines of of Much Ado are very simple and clear and straightforward. And and um, the opening lines of Twelfth Night, when Orsino, I, I do have this passage in the book, uh, If Music Be the Food of Love, Play On. O- often a trick is to, the, the opening lines of a play can be very accessible to kids. You know, Shakespeare has so much to tell us in the modern world. There, there's so many great moral values. There's so many um, uh, ways of... uh, The basic philosophy is a kindly, humane um, uh, way of looking at life. I mean, you know, he's very aware of of the difficulties of life. King Lear is difficult when this poor king is ravaged by the, the... the unkindness of his of two of his daughters, but ultimately lives through uh, a, 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 um, a cycle that that brings him to a clear eyed sanity, and that's so much so true of Shakespeare in general that 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 he he has us through the stories live through trials and. A, a, a wonderfully engaging story that illustrates those trials uh, where the human spirit triumphs in some way, be it in the tragedies where they die, you know, the, the hero may die, or in the comedies where the hero or the, the couple triumph. So I, I think that's one thing to, to, to say that parents should keep in mind. I, I think another is 
is that um, uh, what kids gain, what I found with my kids and why the book was so important to me was that what kids gain from uh, 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 taking the time to, to learn these passages um, and, and then gain a, a familiarity with Shakespeare is is a, a kind of inner intellectual backbone. Yeah. A, 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 wow, a, what a great a, way of putting that. Yeah. They they they, did, they probably will fool themselves. They they didn't know they had it in them <laughs> to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and mm-hmm. you and you suddenly can read a lot of literature as you grow older. It's not Shakespeare, but that gives you a frame of reference that simply makes you smarter. Yeah. It gives you confidence. So they do do better on tests. You don't do it so you do better on tests, but you do it because you become a a more intelligent being. Well, there's so many allusions to Shakespeare in books we read and just in the culture. So I think that in Western culture, you know, so I think it does improve your intelligence on a very, I mean, even if it's just from understanding where those kind of allusions are coming from. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely right. That's very important. Uh, I quote a, a, a this quotation uh, I used from uh, a Falstaff from Henry the Fourth Part, uh, fourth part One, um, where the great comic character Falstaff says, "I am not only witty in myself; I am the cause that wit is in other men." Hmm. And Shakespeare is just that. He is yeah. not only intelligent and witty in himself, but all, all. I mean, I can really say this, and and and, and know that I'm not. You know, nobody can fool me and go, "Aha, you were wrong." Somebody, somebody didn't know their Shakespeare. They all knew their Shakespeare. <laughs> there isn't a great writer or a great filmmaker, yeah. uh, or, or or a great opera composer, or any great artist, or or or, or a um, visual artist. There, there is not a great artist after Shakespeare who didn't know his or her Shakespeare. Yeah, that's amazing. So when you watch, when you read Jane Austen, well, she has tons of allusions to Shakespeare in, in her novels. Mm-hmm. When you read Charles Dickens, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. who loved to act, and he was constantly acting Shakespeare as a young man. And his books are, again, constantly referring to Shakespearean kind of situations. You know, what is Fagin but a kind of Shylock figure in a way? Uh, you know, what are, what are his heroes but very much the young heroes from Much Ado and Twelfth Night? Uh, so uh, all the great authors that we love so much had a lot of Shakespeare in them. And if we know our Shakespeare we really become better at, at decoding those works and, and understanding them. Yeah, and then I think what you said earlier, too, it just kind of makes you more fully human or fully alive to kind of engage with these great ideas, the great ideas of the past yeah. are really all contained in Shakespeare. So, yeah. Yeah, well said. That's exactly right. Makes you, it makes you, a, you know, what we're all trying to do for our kids and for ourselves, but certainly for our kids, is to, is to make them into better human beings. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's definitely time well worth spent on this podcast. Um, well we're often talking about is building a family culture around books. And I think um, the choosing of books that form really good humans is kind of what we're trying to lean toward. And you just, I mean, that Shakespeare Mm -hmm. get cuts right to the heart of that. So it it does, it does. And, and, and by taking the time to, I mean, look, all of us as, as caring parents, and I can just hear it with you, obviously. And, 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 but all of us, I mean, how many parents do we know that aren't that way? love to sit and read with our kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, a lot of the joy we take in life is transmitting our joy in books and great movies and things with our kids. And, 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 and taking the time to memorize something together, and ultimately you may decide, hey, I, I've done enough Shakespeare for now, maybe now having, you know... Uh, <laughs> learn this sort of method, if you will, I'm going to look at some words worth together. Yeah, that's a great uh, point. In the um, in the first episode of this podcast, I talked to Andrew Pudua from the Institute for Excellence in Writing, and he, um, he was talking about how the two best things that you can do for your child 
to help them become a good communicator or a good writer is to read aloud and to memorize beautiful language. So when you think about that and you consider what we're doing here with memorizing pieces of Shakespeare's plays, that's like... Well, I hate using the cliche killing two birds with one stone, but it's really like a double whammy for <laughs> for your time as far as you yeah. know. Yeah. I think so too. I'm glad he said that. Yeah. Memorizing memorizing is is, is all it's not a lost art. That would be overstating it because there's too many of us like you and me out there who who want to do it with the kids. But mm-hmm. as we've gotten into this internet age, you know, the 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 um a, a parent uh answer and it and it's not. I mean, using apparent quotations, or ironically, is that gee, why do I need to memorize anything? Because I can. It's at my fingertips. I can find it on the internet. Right. In no time. Right. It's not like gee, I can't find it. Which book is it in? Or how do I track it down? If you remember what two words were in it that were unusual, you type it in the internet and bang, or you, you you get the passage on the screen. But of course that. That has nothing to do with internal, you know, internalizing the passage yeah. and understanding it or getting the joy from the language. Well, then you really the, can't call on it when you, if you really need, you know, when you need it. And if it's somewhere out there and you think, well, I just need to know when, where I can go to get it. But if you hide it away inside of yourself, then you always have it. You can always call on it to comfort you or to, you know, thrill you or to help you through a tough situation it becomes a part of you so i think yeah memory works exactly, exactly. well said it's exactly right that having it at your fingertips makes all the difference in the world because it's it it really is part of you yeah yeah mm. that it's not if you just can find just because you can find it it's it, it, it's not part of you right yeah what well, motivates me to want to memorize more too, and I've been memorizing with my kids. Like, but like I said, they are faster than I am, so I have to work a little harder than they do. But <laughs> sorry to say, that's so are, the mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been fantastic, and I hope it's encouraged all of our listeners to go get your hands on this book. Really, I said on my blog last year that I think the purchase of this book was probably my. You know, we homeschool our kids. At, um, my family homeschools, and I think it was our best purchase of the entire year. I mean, it it has been so fruitful in our home so it's really blessed us i think it will i think you'll be surprised by how excited your kids can get about shakespeare even if you don't have any experience with shakespeare before so it is in paperback uh now so you can get it on amazon or wherever books are sold of course and i'll have links in the show notes if you um to make it easy for you to find how to teach your children Shakespeare, as well as all of the retellings that we talked about in the podcast today. And then don't forget, you can go to how to teach your children Shakespeare.com and you can get a more peaks of the book, a sample chapter, I think, is there, and then those audio clips that Ken was telling us about. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast. This is Let the Kids Speak, where kids get to tell us about the books that have been read aloud to them. Hello, my name is Lauren and I am 10 years old and I live in the Gold Coast in Australia. I loved listening to Drover's Road by Joyce West and published by Bethlehem Books. I liked it because it was very interesting and full of excitement. The main character is a girl named Gabrielle Allen who tells the story of her adventures in New Zealand. My favourite part of the book is when Gabrielle and her cousin Mary nearly drown in a secret cave. Get the book and discover how they were rescued. Don't forget that your child can leave a message for me to be on the Read Aloud Revival podcast by going to readaloudrevival.com, scrolling to the bottom of the page and leaving me a message there. All the show notes, all the details are at readaloudrevival.com. This is episode six, for just, so just look for the picture of Ken Ludwig, click the button, and you'll be on your way. Until next time, go build your family culture around books. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.